Yes, you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being. Wow, you guys are phenomenal. When I will, I mean, it's amazing. What a audience to preach to. Can you believe this? I have the privilege to look at your faces and all the deco and preach to you guys. What an honor to preach to such an awesome church. Really, uh, you guys are the best in the world. I've never seen anything like you. I always tell you, you're a peculiar, strange people. You are an acquired taste, <laughs> okay? Um, with, uh, with an acquired grace, okay? And that's important to understand. It's, uh, it's a very, very special, special people uh, who can be free like you. You see, it seems like something has happened internally. Something shifted inside of you, and you can be you. That's what I see. I see a whole lot of yous. And I'm so glad I don't see a whole lot of me's, you know? And you can go into a charismatic Pentecostal revival somewhere, and you can see a whole lot of people who look like the pastor, you see? And I thank God that none of you look like me, okay? N nothing wrong with me. <laughs> I'm very confident. But um, I'm just saying, you are just uniquely your expression. And that's just awesome. Just well, well done. Come on, give yourself a big hand. It's awesome. Well done. Well done. Because it shows that Christ has done his job with you. He, Christ has done his job and he's doing his job with you because he's getting the best of you out. That's who Christ is. Christ didn't come. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if, uh, if you're watching me online and you're coming and watching this for the first time and you're looking at our church and you think we're a bit nuts. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there might be a few here though. <laughs> but, uh, but to tell you the truth, it's just that we have found, uh, there's a quote in the Bible that says, Christ has set you free and if he set you free, you are free indeed. That's really in the Bible. If he set you free, he says, you are free indeed. Now, what does that mean? And I want to talk about it. It means that there's something that Christ can do in our hearts that with the shackles fall off our feet and suddenly we identify not with some, someone far away, a, a large God or some old man in the sky who's looking down punitively wanting to give you the law or punish you. It means when Christ has set you free, he came down to the earth so that you yourself, man, the body. In fact, interestingly, uh, Jesus, uh, when they talk about Jesus in the book of Hebrews, it literally says this. He says about this freedom, he says, sacrifice and offering, he literally says, sacrifice and offering, which is the law system, he says, you never wanted, you never desired. That's really there in the Bible. Sacrifice and offering, you never desired, but this body you have given to me. Okay, now what does that mean? It means somehow, um, remember this is the neuroscience of grace, and I just want to dive into this and just give it and break it down for you. Somehow, in the, old, in the Old Testament, the Jews and Paul so vehemently understood, let me put this phone off, okay. Somehow Paul understood in the old, in the, with the Old Testament and the New Testament, he understood this, and this is crazy stuff, he understood that it was the body that kept the errors. Strange. Now, in today's, in today's scientific uh, medical world, they're realizing that only now. That the body, and in fact, um, uh, what is that? Uh, Paul actually calls it the body of errors. The body of sin. That's really strange. That means he says that every error, every pattern that you have from your traumas, your pains, your past, is not in your mind. Hello. It's so important to get this. He says that when you react in a certain way to certain things, it's not a psychological issue. Paul is writing this. He says it can be changed through the mind. Okay? But he literally says it is the body, and he says every member, and I spoke about it last time, he says that every member, he says if you have stolen before with your hands, then now in the church you use your hands to heal. Because he knew that the body or the members of the hand need to be redeemed. He explains it beautifully. And it's, it's quite mind-blowing that he had this type of insight. And Romans 7, Romans 8 is actually him going into the details of the insight. And right there is psychology, neuroscience, all put together. We'll just go there. I'll show you something uh, that will blow you away. Romans 7. He knew that when you were running from the bear, you were not running because you were scared of the bear. He knew that you are running from the bear, and then while you're running, you get scared. Come on. 
This is mind-bending stuff. And there's a guy called William James who actually came out with this a couple of, I think, uh, maybe close to 100 years ago, a little less. And he said, something not right here. When I'm running from the bear, I'm not running because I'm scared. I'm scared because I'm running. Okay? And then he brought this amazing concept that they're using in neuroscience and psychology right now, and it's called the concept of appraisal or reappraisal. That means while you're running, ask the question, why am I running? Don't decide I'm running because of the scared of the bear. Ask the question, why am I running? And he says, if you appraise yourself, now, doesn't that suck? can you just see this? Because that's exactly what Jesus said. That's exactly what Paul said. The word appraisal is the same word as repent. Come on. It's the same word. The word repent is the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia. So while you're running, you repent. Metanoia means the, the basic word of metanoia is change your mind. Okay? The deeper word of that is going, go beyond the matter. Go beyond the, the, the body. <laughs> Come on. Go beyond the body that is running. And like, why am I running? Why do I feel like this? Why am I, why am I doing something like this? Why is my facial... Those days, I can tell you, uh, Fiona and I, uh, we work on this uh, constantly. You see, those days, like when I, I realized... You know, my mom used to always tell me, Kirby, you don't know how to talk to people. Okay? Those days. I think, I, don't, I think she won't agree with me anymore. But she won't say that anymore. But those days, she would always say, when I was young, you know, Kirby, you never know how to talk to people. You never know how to talk to people. And at one point, I had, of course, this is a, this is a very bad story, but I got together with my, with my friend uh, Sunanda at that time, who was my driver cum uh, thug life. Uh, and um, we had beaten up the, the, the guy who climbs the coconut tree for some odd reason. And anyway, he was a hardcore guy. You can imagine with his little, I mean, he had a knife on his side and the whole thing. And he had caught us on the road. And, um, and we were now on the road, me like 12 or something like that. Okay, but I, was, I used to want, I used to go to uh, Nandana Caters, which was the, which, which was the shop uh, up, the, uh, up the road. And uh, Nandana Caters, the Mudla Ali was there. His, friend Sarat, his son Sarat was a friend of mine. I used to go in the van with him to school. And so, but at 14, I used to go to Nandana Caters and ask the father to give me a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say, Mudla Ali, cigarette packet had done. So uh, the way I used to do it, because I used to think he knows, he knows I'm the same age of his son and the whole thing. So maybe he has some sort of offense with me or whatever it is that I'm smoking at this young age. So the way I used to ask him, Mulali, cigarette packet had done? You know, like that. And he used to fling the pack at me. And whenever I go to a bar to, at, at that age, yes, at that time, uh, at 14, 15, we were <laughs> going to these places. And when I go anywhere, when I talk to someone, it would come out in a, in a way that I would end up with a fight. And that day, this tough, rough uh, coconut plucker, okay, you can imagine, right? This guy, these guys would, would have no problem pull a knife on you. Um, but he t decided to take me to my mom. He said, come here. Let's go and talk to your mother. <laughs> okay, because he knew mom. And I remember I went up to mom, and I was telling mom, you know, this guy, da 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 And suddenly I got a slap. Okay? And that slap was from my mom. And I was like... In front of this guy, you hit, <laughs> like, <laughs> like wrong, <laughs> wrong sense of loyalty, <laughs> all right? Yeah. And at that point, she said it again, I slapped you because you don't know how to talk to people. You don't know how to talk to people. That's stuck in my mind with the slap, with the trauma. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> right? And even deep inside of me, you don't know how to talk to people. And as I grew up in life, every time I talked to someone, this would stick in my head. You don't know how to talk to people. So, they, I mean, there, there are good traumas and there are bad traumas. <laughs> okay? Uh, and and I, would, I would realize if, if she, she never told me, and if, in fact, if I wasn't shaken to the telling, okay, I wouldn't have realized that I didn't know how to talk to people. I really didn't know. And naturally, it would just... The, 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 whatever it was would just come out, me, out of me. I, was, uh, I didn't talk singly so well as well, and so people under, misunderstood me, and I was loud, I was boisterous. There was something in my nervous system that didn't allow me to talk to people in a normal way. This took a long time for me to start reversing and changing, but it was an appraisal. Suddenly when I'm talking, 
people used to say, Kirby, you're talking very loud. And even now, when I go into a room and I start talking with this group, I'm talking, talking. I'm the loudest guy in the room. I don't talk much. But if I start talking, I'm loud. And then I, just, I remember, Mom, you don't know how to talk. Tune down. Because, because it somehow something got into my nervous system where the way I would talk would be a bit boisterous, okay? a bit intense, to say the least. Okay? And it was just in my nervous system. And, and I remember when I started going out with Fiona, Fiona responds, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this. Fiona responds when I get intense with facial expressions. Okay? And her facial expressions communicate a lot. And the more intense I get, the more intense I get, I see tears welling up in her eyes. You see, and when tears well up in her eyes, that's a sign, but, but it's too late. By the time I decided to tone down, because I had to cut the backtrack, and I, you know, I, I can't say I'm sorry very fast, and all this kind of stuff, you know, I have to try to justify myself, and by the time I backtrack, she's crying. Okay? But the thing is, those are all what I'm trying to explain to you is, my nervous system is talking in some way. Her nervous system is talking in another way. None of us want to say or do what we are doing. But we can't help it. The body of sin is responding according to something that has been passed down, maybe in this life or maybe generationally through my parents, through my father's fathers. We don't know what kind of trauma that people have gone through. You know, the Mount Sinai uh, Research Institute, they, they literally said that there was a person who was constantly feeling cold, constantly feeling cold, constantly feeling cold, constantly feeling cold. And they, they, to the extent, and this was a sports person, so this person could never warm up. So, but he was a high-level high level sports high, uh, person. And um, uh, he, they could, he could never warm up. And when they, they had to take him to a session of uh, really hypnotism, I won't recommend hypnotism to anybody unless you know the person very well. So don't go. Uh, however, uh, he, went, he went to a session of hypnotism. And they retraced back to the fact that his grandfather was caught up in a trauma and caught up in ice for a long time and actually died like that, and his grandfather. And, and somehow, generationally, he got locked up in the cold. Locked up. So until they retraced and changed the trauma, his nervous system could not respond correctly to, to warm him up. And that's how they corrected it. And he'd gone to every doctor, taken hormone therapy, taken every single thing, but could not change the way the nervous system responded. Come on. So when Paul says this, I want you to see it, and it's quite interesting. When Paul says... The body of sin, he is just, he is on point, and this is 2,000 years ago. This guy was superb, and he understood it. So he was, here it is in Romans, where is it? Romans, where are we? Romans uh, 7, right? Okay. Okay, Romans 7 at the end of it. Okay, I'll just read a bit of it for you. And from... Verse 21, or let's just take verse 17, okay? But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my, and he explains it, that is in my flesh. flesh. Okay, I don't know if that's soma or sarks, but it says in my flesh. Okay, the word soma is more body. Nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not know, I cannot find. He's literally saying, my body is doing something else. Like, I promised when I go for lunch, I will not order sweets. I've said it, I will not, I'm going for lunch. Some, some of you, not my story, I'm telling you a story. <laughs> I promised I will not order sweets because I ordered sweets yesterday and day before. But somehow when I get, for, get to lunch, although the will is present with me not to do it, when I see the ice cream, Something happens. But I don't want to. But my body is doing it. You see? So he understood that the pattern is in the body. The association is in the body. Do you, you, you understand it? How many of you have smoked before? You know what smoke? Have you, have you smoked? Yeah. Very, very few. Yeah. OK. <laughs> these, are, these thrones are they're, they're real. OK. <laughs> OK. You, OK. You, You'll realize that, you'll realize, uh, oh, I said, have you smoked before? That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> OK. Yeah. I'll rephrase the question. Uh, OK. <laughs> so 
so, yeah, so you see, the problem is that it's the association, isn't it? Like, if you're smoking, you'll realize that this association is the hardest thing to do. In fact, if you just do like this and do like that, you still feel good. And not even smoking a cigarette. You see, it's because it's in the body. Anyone who plays an instrument will understand you play an instrument of a little while, your hands are moving, you're not even thinking. It has become psychosomatically locked down. Now, if that pattern is in your body, imagine what else is in it. Do you understand it? And so, so one of the, the main ways that the body gets affected, it opens. Like your subconscious mind or your spirit is closed. But it can only open, there are four main ways. One is fear, trauma. Okay, when there's fear, like mom slap. Okay, and then you don't know how to talk. Did well for me. Okay, but they, I mean, there are very few things like that, that will do well. Okay, there's so many other things that have now got inside. The other one is love, like I always say. The other one, if you love someone, okay, you could say the same thing. You don't know how to talk. I don't know where it'll work. I'm not sure. Let's see. I don't think, <laughs> but uh, I don't think, okay? But, uh, but love also works really well, and that's what we do here. We, uh, you come in here, you're, you're feeling safe. What are you doing with pom-poms and Philip? I mean, look how fa uh, fa safe Philip feels. You know, he can come with a pineapple on his head <laughs> and, think, and, and feel safe, okay? What does that mean? It means your guards are down, okay? So what does that do for me? What is that, how does that help me? It helps me hypnotize you well. <laughs> okay, why? Because I've got you to wear a pineapple on your head. If I can get you to wear a pineapple on your head, then for me to sow a seed into your heart, it's already done. Look at this guy with the wig here. <laughs> He's finished. <laughs> He's about forever. <laughs> but, you, but you get what I'm trying to say. This thing works like that, and that's why Hymns, church, they, they knew what they were doing. They were not just trying to be just friendly and nice. They had hymns during service those days. Today we have house music during service. And then everyone feels like, oh man, this is so cool, this is so cool. And they open their heart. So two things are program you. One is fear. Okay? There are churches you go to, don't worry, they get the same thing done. Okay? They, a guy comes on stage and says, do you know that if you will not receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today, that if you die today after you leave this meeting, you will go to hell. And as you do that, you get scared. Your nervous system is scared. And then whatever he says after that, you're like, aye, aye, sir. Yeah. yeah? You see, there's so many ways of programming the spirit, the unconscious mind, the subconscious mind. Now, Paul is explaining this, and I, I want you to see it. And there's two more ways. One more, one more way, if you listen to me carefully, you realize that if you go to a father figure, that's why... Churches, they got it right when they call, or the Catholic Church said it, Father, Father, Father. Hmm? Okay? Because as you say Father or Mother, you're open like this in a second. And now whatever he says, I hope if he's, if, he's a, if he's a terrible father, you get programmed very fast. But same with doctor. Hmm? Same with doctor. Okay, you go to doctor and he gives you three months to live, you're in big trouble. Because that's why you go to the right doctor. Because as you go, you submit yourself and go. So i rather... So these are things you got to remember. When I go to a doctor, I don't open myself up. In fact, when I'm going to a doctor, I'm like, yeah, doctor. And in fact, most of the time, about my body, I know quite a lot. So I'm like, da, 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 da. But I love my doctors. They are my friends. They're my buddies. They come to uh, our church. But I don't open myself up like that in case I need to reprogram what has been said. OK? Uh, the fourth major thing that we are constantly doing to reprogram our spirit is repetition. And that's what Paul is talking about. We're doing it constantly, continuously, and that's what I started saying. And that's what the law was. The law was a repetitive programming concept for Jews who were slaves and did not want to first change their mind, but God had another way of doing it. So get this. Old Testament is programming through the external, internally. Old Testament. You do, you do, you do, you do, you do. You're running, you're running, you're running. You're playing, you're playing, you're playing. You're saying, you're saying, you're saying. And then your mind says, why are you doing this? Okay, or you've got a pencil in your mouth. And you're smiling, smiling, smiling. The mind says, why are you smiling? What's so funny? And it says, oh, you may be happy. It says, okay, I'll reinforce happiness. You see? Some of you need to keep a pencil in your mouth constantly. 
Okay? <laughs> right? Because, no, because the, your body doesn't know what it's saying. As you got a pencil in your mouth, it says, this is, this is neuroscience. So let's say the, the mind goes after what the body is saying. Okay? That's what Paul is saying. Okay? So if you smile more often, that was very hard for me. Okay? Because I'm an introvert. Okay? So when I first started doing this job, Neil would tell me, son, when you finish the meeting, there's the afterglow. He calls it the afterglow, okay? And, you know, I, dis I dislike the concept, yeah? Now we have after party. <laughs> I dislike the concept. He said, there's an afterglow, son. He said, a good pastor will hang around and go and talk to the people. He will be the last to leave. A good pastor. Okay? But I wanted to be the guy with the bodyguards who come in. I stand. No one can get to me, okay? And then... When I, when, I, when I finish the meeting, bodyguards take me and I'm out. Okay? I wanted to be that one. But he said a good pastor. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, to be a good shepherd. And it was the hardest thing for me to do because I'm an introvert. And, I'm, and it's very hard for me to make conversations. So for me to start finishing the meeting, going up to people, shaking their hand, how are you, what's your name, you know, and I'm preaching weird stuff. Uh, people do weird things in this place. Okay? It's like I feel always I had to give an explanation. I had to explain ourselves, you know, apologize for who we are. You know? And constantly after the meeting, I'm like, is it okay? Did you enjoy the meeting? You know? and, but I had to constantly do it, constantly do it, constantly do it, constantly do it, constantly do it. And as I did it, my nervous system opened up. And it became easy for me. Now it's so easy for me to go up to someone new and say, hey, how are you doing? What's up? How, how, how's it going? Can I hang out with you? And, you know, and then Fiona's like, no, oh, we're going out. <laughs> you know, so, but it became easy because of constant repetition. Okay? Again, the law is external in, way, in words. The New Testament is internal outside. They both have to work together. Yeah. You can't, there were, there were times in my life, if you remember, if you've been with me too long, I would say, the law is wicked, don't touch it, this, that, all that. Okay, I have grown from that place. I've realized that we need both. We need both. There are times that I need the law. Like last time I was in the USA, and, and, and it was grace, 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 and we just ate all the USA food with all the, uh, they have, what is it, uh, all the preservatives. And then we came back, believe me when I tell you guys, it changed my hormones. That one month of eating like that changed my hormones for like five, six months. Like I was just putting on, I was putting on weight. I was like, what the heck? I'm, I'm starving here. I'm just putting on weight. That's the, just the, the preservatives changed the hormones. You know, and Fiona and me took, and Fiona, is a, she exercised twice a day. And she was struggling to lose the weight. Two, two and a half months, two and a half months, no? Now she's looking gorgeous. <laughs> but but you, you, you get it, yeah? And so what did we have to do? Because we were in grace, yeah. hmm? I had to come back home and then put the law again because as I woke up in the morning, I wanted um, Starbucks coffee with sugar. <laughs> okay? And that has sugar, yeah? And, and I had to deploy the law in an inhibitory way so that now I can get in grace. Now I'm in grace. Okay, now I'm like, right, okay, it's done. Okay, and now, this time I go, I'm thinking, dude, to facilitate the grace you're in, because now I'm in grace, like I can have sweets or whatever it is, and my, I feel my body is bright, I can run again, I feel fit again, all this. And so, now to facilitate the grace I'm in, I'm not going to make the same mistake, because I don't want the law to come back on me again. You get it? So I'm going to go to the USA, and I'm going to watch my exercise. I'm going to watch the food I eat, and I'm going to facilitate. That's not the law. That's not the law. Please understand. It's not the law. I can do those things, but now I have received a grace, and I will uphold the grace I'm in. It's easy. The struggle phase is over. The law is when there's a struggle phase. And from the struggle phase, there's a release phase, where the law will kill you and you die. And after the release phase, you get the grace and the flow phase. You understand that? So now I'm in the grace and the flow phase. Okay? And so I don't want to go back to a struggle phase. Because this cycle happens on a macro level. That means you can have it yearly, or they call it ultradian rhythms. You can have this daily. In different areas in your life, you will have this phase constantly like a cycle. You're going to have a struggle phase. You're going to have then a release phase, the, where you, the death of the cross, the repentance, 
where you die, you repent, you change your mind, and then you're going to have the flow of grace place. But this can happen daily to you in different situations in your life. In fact, it can happen in an hour. It can happen in a year, or that phase can happen in an hour with something. Maybe you're here for the first time, you're listening to what I'm saying, you don't understand what the heck I'm saying, you're struggling. Okay, keep struggling, keep coming, and after a little while, you say, huh, I understand you. It's not that I got any better, it's just that the struggle went, and some, something died, and now you're open. You got it? So watch Paul say it again. I'm going to explain this. This is so beautiful. Okay, he says it again here. In verse 21, I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God. Is it there? Is it there? I can't say that on the song again. <laughs> oh God, that was so good. <laughs> A lot of those faces. <laughs> okay, it's there, right? It's there, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> okay, so, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my... Can you believe this guy nailing this? I mean, he's nailing it like I'm reading a science paper. He said, but I see another law in my members. He said, my inward man, my heart is saying something else, but my members, my, my fingers are saying something else. My nose is saying something else. My body is moving that way towards the cake when my mind is moving that way. Has that happened to you? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. So I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Wow, so he's saying it's not a psychological thing. This guy's a genius. They're realizing now the trauma is not a psychological thing. Can you believe this? It's a physical thing. It's to get somatically locked down in the body. And so this is so cool. And he says, war against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my body, my members. When he says members, it means every member of your body has patterns. It's just amazing. Can you believe it? Yeah. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this what? From my mind? No. From the body. Wow. You see? The body of death. These patterns of death that happened to me. And he says, I thank God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Watch this. This is the most mind-blowing statement. When you see this statement, it says, this guy knew God. Okay? So, so then he says this. So then, so then, because this, um, this um, polarity is there, if you want to call it, okay, because there is this, this duality lives in me. So then, with the mind, myself will serve the law of God, with, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Do you just see that there? So literally saying, okay, so let's, let's agree on this. That my body will always be in patterns. Okay? But my mind can transcend the patterns. You see? And he's bringing the New Testament concept of grace. Because God first wanted to meet them on the mountain so that they would be changed inside and then be able to change from inside out. But they said, we don't want it. Don't forget that. And then he gave them the law so that they will be able to change outside in. You see? And so there's nothing wrong in that. Outside in is great. In fact, I use outside in for some of the miracles and signs and wonders I do. I use ritual to get it done. You understand? I use a ritual to get it done. Some signs and wonders and miracles I do, I use just, I don't. See, because when you do use ritual, when it's outside in, you use angels and all this kind of stuff because they're the ones who give the law. They are celestial intelligences that keep the law. They, they like you to be on time. Trust me on this. Angels work according to times and seasons and patterns. Patterns, seasons, times. The world is full of subdivisions of patterns, seasons, and times. If you want to get anything done in the world, you have to follow patterns, seasons, and times. Okay? But thank God now, because of Christ, I can repent. Repent means I can change my mind because now, not the kingdom of the world of patterns are here, but the kingdom of God is now invading the pattern world. Come on. Do you just see that? Okay? So the idea is a dance between the two. So sometimes I will use, for the stuff, some of the stuff I do, I will use ritual, the law itself, for the miracle that I used grace yesterday. Do you just, I just want to show you the nuances of this. How I did it yesterday was through, without outsourcing, I was the son of God, I came and did it. I was the son of God, 
And he said, Kabi, how do you do that? How do you uh, do, do a miracle? How did someone get healed? How did money get transferred? How did something happen? I'm like, well, I just came. I just felt so good. I was like, I felt so loved. I felt I, my, myself was an identity. I just spoke, and it happened. Has that happened to you? You speak, and things happen? The whole creation is responding to you? The patterns are responding to Romans 8? Yeah? Okay? But sometimes it doesn't happen like that. Because you switched from that place. And at that time, you need to use ritual, patterns, cycles. You need to then go back into a time of prayer. You, you, you see, you need to do it on time like that again, like how you started. And as you start doing it like that, again, you get into grace. You use the law as a tutor to get in there. Is that okay? Okay. So I love this statement here. He says, it's amazing. He says, I thank God for Jesus Christ, my Lord. Okay. So then with my mind, I may serve the law of, God, law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So that is where we are. We will serve God with our mind. Our body will always serve the patterns of the world. Is that okay with you? Yeah. yeah? And we, we, are, we are not trying to convert the body now. That's not the idea. The idea is the nervous system will always like patterns and cycles. Okay? He always likes patterns and cycles. That's the way it works. Do you know that they've studied that people who are very stressed, very stressed, people who are extremely stressed, that they make patterns very fast. They will... The, the pattern make more than the others because they want, because of the stress, and that is why they stereotype. You see, I've noticed this. I've noticed it when people are stressed out, they stereotype very fast. Hmm. That means they'll say, okay, all people with long hair and beards are probably Aragale. <laughs> Someone said that, right? <laughs> or JVP or community, something like that. Something like that. Some, someone said something like that. I can't remember. <laughs> so when you're stressed, okay, you stereotype. Because it's economic for you to make a stereotype, okay, a pattern, okay, uh, so that now, you know, this is the way it's easy because I'm too stressed in my life, I will go with the pattern. And as you see a person with a beard, okay, and long hair, there's that feeling, the funny feeling that you might get. I don't get it. <laughs> okay? But, but, you, but you understand, okay? Or you see someone... Um, you, you see, um, what is it? Well, give, give me some good stereotypes. Throw some good stereotypes. And me, huh? Tattoos. What else? Rainbow colors. <laughs> uh, come on, give me some good stereotypes that what people are saying. Huh? What is it? Yeah, blondes. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't want to bring that up. That's a very, very bad stereotype, okay? <laughs> Yeah, as long as that you are male blonde as well. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but that's a stereotype, yeah? That's very good, yeah, yeah. So, so people who are stressed, they like to see in patterns. So that guy wear a pair of shorts, okay, he's not wearing a nice watch, maybe he doesn't have money, okay? You should come to America, none of them have nice watches, they're all in shorts, they all them. <laughs> each one has like 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, and they come to the meeting like that as well, okay? So you see, it's a stereotype. Because we are stressed, we will make... We will go with the pattern, and then we are responding to a person in a certain way, according to a pattern, not doing a repentance or a reappraisal. Hmm? I want you to see that people who are highly stressed, they've, done, they've literally done this. They literally say that if there is a sad face and a happy face, okay, just get this. This teaches you a lot. If there's a sad face and a happy face, and always a sad face is on the left, and a happy, not a happy face, but a normal face is on the right. They literally say if they tell those people with their... With, with two buttons, when you see the face on the left, which is a sad face, you can click a button. The face on the right, which is uh, the normal face, you can click a button on it with your, with your right. Left is what? Sad. Right is? Normal. Okay? And they say that the person who is sad will click the sad face much faster than he will click the happy face. So you take a thousand people, and if you look at your temperature that we have with joy meter, and if you are at a four, the first people you see is all fours. I'm teaching you how to prophesy. Hmm? It's all fours. But here's the interesting thing, okay? That when they check, and they call this attention bias, to see whether the person can change, which is another, they do another thing where they put an arrow, and they point the other way to the happy face, and get them to click, they take a longer time, once they're fixated on the sad face, they take a long time to move out of the pattern. That means their mind is constantly on. Unknowing. They're not thinking. 
When you go into a crowd, they just see the faces and they already made connections. Okay? Because it's the nervous system that just attracts you to that person. And what happens if you get Jesus inside your heart? What happens if you get favor into your heart? What happens if you learn to reappraise yourself and repent immediately? What happens is, while you're running, or while you think that you're scared, or while you think that you're agitated, traumatized, or while Fiona, while tears are welling up in her eyes, and while my voice is rising higher and higher and higher, and while all that is happening, what happens if you just repent? Reappraise yourself. That's how the New Testament works. While that is happening, don't think, and here's the sad part of the, well, it's a sad part, it's not a pun, but the sad part of the situation is that when people see you cry and when people see you in a bad mood, everyone in the room who sees you in a bad mood and everyone who sees you crying in the room, they naturally, if they are in the same temperature and the same climate, naturally, what happens? We've got a bit of a conspiracy going on. Because naturally, they will now come together. You've got to understand how this thing works. It's because temperature attracts temperature. Those days, I was so judgmental that everything I saw about a person I thought of as a prophet, being a Christian, because I was taught that the prophetic is to be able to see people's sins. So adultery, fornication, okay? So I would come into a church and everyone, okay? Because that's what I was taught, that maybe in adultery, fornication, this, that, all that, those are the guys I pick up. Then I started picking up saying, how do I know adultery? Okay? i am not committed adultery once I was married, but... But, uh, my God, I've not been faithful when I was young with Fiona. So I know. When I look at someone, suddenly, that old, the face. I can tell you a guy, I can tell you a player when I look at one. You bring me your boyfriends, will you? <laughs> <laughs> you bring your boyfriends and come, will you? I'll tell you. I'll say, okay, this year. <laughs> okay. All the young ones. Okay. Because, because being there, done that, know that. Come on, I'm just trying to show you something. Yeah, girlfriends, I don't know, but I won't be able to say. I'll have to bring, I'll have to bring you. <laughs> but I'm just trying to show you how we know is because there's something in us that plays something. But then we think we're so prophetic. And then we think we're so holy. That's the, that's the sad part of it. And all these prophets were prophesying on adultery and exposing sin. You're seeing what is inside of you. That's why he stopped prophesying like that. When, when one day I was standing in Prophet's Covid's church, and was, I was dancing, and there's one of these African prophets in front of me. And he wanted to make an impression with me. So I, he saw me, and he came around like this. And see, they, what they do is they cold read. Okay, so cold read, I don't know, cold reading means they can look at someone, they're so good at it. And so he came up and said, you have boxed when you were young. So I was like, Wow, this guy is cool. You know, he can prophesy. I'm like, yeah, that's right. I was bronze national champion. I'm getting all, you know, proud of like God can see me, the boxer. Oh, I feel so loved. You know, my championship is. He can see me. God can see me. And I was in a little Pentecostal frenzy for a little moment. Till suddenly I reappraised myself. <laughs> I said, oh, the music was playing. I mean, the music plays the way I dance. Anyone knows? I got a bit of. I don't have dance rhythm. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'd be a bit of boxing rhythm. And I'm like, huh. I'm like, this guy watched me. Because one time I opened my eyes and I saw him, he was watching me. I was like, oh, he watched me. He saw my movements and then he came and told me. Because he saw it in my nervous system. So after that, I decided that I'll be very stoic <laughs> with these guys. And I don't give anything away. My hands are like this. Okay? And I don't give anything away because I want to know whether they're actually hearing from God or it's just BS. Okay? The whole lot of that around yeah. in this country. <laughs> but you see, the fact of the matter is that your nervous system gives it away because it's already locked inside of you. You'll be able to see a guy who's on smoking dope because you know what the feeling is like. You'll see a guy who's doing that because you know what the feeling is like. And it's all to do with your nervous system. So God gives you a chance now through Jesus Christ and he gives you this whole thing that the body, watch this, comes onto the earth, okay? And the key about Jesus is the body dies. Not the mind. 
So you identify with the death of the body when you see the cross. And so when you take the communion, come on, this is so good. We're going to close. But this, is, this deserves a cheer because you knew exactly what you're doing. That's why it's called neuroscience of grace. Because then you're taking the body and you're taking someone's body. This body is broken for you. You're taking someone else's pain and you're taking it and you're breaking it. And you're saying, my body is broken and dead and crucified. And you identify with the death of the body. So now... Once I've identified it, people start getting healed if you do it properly. That's why communion is powerful. Because you're identifying with the death of the nervous system and the body, and it is finished, you've done your communion, and I am dead. And you say this prayer, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yea, not me, but now the Christ lives inside of this body. And now these members, it says, become members of righteousness and slaves of justice and righteousness. Did you just get it? Before that, they were slaves of sin, and suddenly everything we're doing with this body is different. My, my hardest thing when I started preaching was, I hope I don't say the bad word. <laughs> because I used to say it, Fiona used to say it much more than I do. I'm, I'm very surprised that she doesn't say it. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but I was, I, my biggest fear when I was preaching was, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, because I get so passionate, right? right? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I might just say that word. Okay? And, but, I never say, but I never said it. No, <laughs> I will never say it. Not on this pulpit. Um, so I might say it outside the pulpit, <laughs> but not on this pulpit. So, but I never said it. And then I realized what Christ did, in, did to me. Then I realized, this is crazy stuff. How the heck? Because it was so easy for me to say it. But how the heck did he, through our mind, suddenly he was able to change the body. Just by saying yes to Jesus, he changed the body. It was so easy. It would just fly out of my, my mouth. It was so easy. Come on, anyone? Hey, come on, Chante, come on. You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Anyone identifies with this one? You should, right? Yeah, come on, you do, right? But how is it happening? I'm not trying, to, I didn't try to stop it. It naturally stopped. It naturally stopped. And that, that is what Christ does. And that is the cross. And when you say, I repent, it means I take every thought captive of my ego man and my self man and everyone, everything I thought about myself and who I was and all these things that are caught up in my traumas and my nervous system and I repent, I go beyond my body into my mind and I accept Christ as my Lord and my Savior and then something happens and bang, the nervous system changes. You understand it? And if it doesn't change, okay, we've got the law. Put yourself under it and finally you'll come to the cross, you will die and then you will change. You see? Is that Okay. I think we've done well. Guys, make sure you're here on Sunday. It's our last meeting, and I'm going to close this chapter, and there'll be more in the USA. Bless you guys. Please stay for the party. Don't go home.